A bit of an inauspicious beginning. First of all, I didn't—I almost didn't get into the building. Uh, my doc—I for, forgot my passport. I used my Vermont driver's license, which miraculously was accepted. It has two out of three of my names, but unfortunately, not my last name that's on the presentation here. Um, I didn't have anything to hook the microphone to. It's actually linked to my bra. And <laughs> as uh, seriously, there's nothing on the dress. And as I, I'm following people who have been talking about magic, who've been talking about volunteerism who are going to speak about defensive architecture, who've been talking about the digital future. And people have come up to me and said, oh, you're a speaker, so what are you, what are you speaking about? And I said, well, um, I'm speaking about how we measure things, how we govern things, and, and why that matters. People say, oh, okay, no. But see, that's the point. That's actually the point, is that this is a very unsexy, very boring, often seen, highly technical, thing that economists do off in their attics and somehow it doesn't really matter for us. But this whole point about metrics, the way the, the systems, the standards for measurement, the social conventions that we use to come up with ways to connect the dots, with ways to distill complex realities into intelligible, actionable, communicatable pieces of information and how we use those. So it's not just the distillation, it's not the, just the creation of metrics, but it's the use of those in some of the currently dominant forms of good governance. It's the combination of those two things that often slips under the radar screen. It's seen as something that's not really something we necessarily want to think about because we're, we're deluged with so many different pieces of information, so many things of data, and you know, do we really want to read the ingredients in this? Do we really want to understand what goes into the sausage? If other people accept it, then why shouldn't we? But I think what I want to convince you of in the next maybe 15 minutes is that redevoting our attention to this, focusing much more on the metrics, on the standards, on the conventions for measurement, and also, on the way that we use those measurements is actually fundamental to the project that seems to be developing here, which is the project of bringing humanity back into institutions, back into the way that we govern ourselves as a species. Not the economics version of humanity, the rational man, rational actor, but the humanity that forms the basis for all of the social connections, for the connecting the dots. So that's what I hope to convince you of in the next 14 minutes now. So, talking about measurement, and I have actually some artwork from a good friend of mine in Mumbai, an artist, I have the same problem with this, okay, which are more just placeholders, just to kind of tell you where I am in this overall topic. So we're talking about measurement. And the thing about measurement, and the thing about metrics is, so it's made, metrics have basically made the headlines a few times recently. So I've, I've, people are probably familiar with the controversy over, over GDP as a measure of economic and social progress. And there's been, the, so the Stiglitz and Fatusi committee, I think, did a great job of explaining why it's, it's not really adequate to capture any sense, or to capture anything but a very limited sense of social progress, why it leaves out many of the things that are most important to us, why it leaves out things that are important for our sustainability and for the sustainability of how we even think about accumulation of wealth. But that's not necessarily new. I mean, Kuznets, the person who, who was one of the early fathers of the GDP concept, explicitly, repeatedly, in public fora, warned against using GDP as anything more than a measure of goods and services produced in a particular country. And we've seen this over time, and, and so there's been a lot of fur about, about GDP. But that's, that's not where it stops, and I think the metrics challenge is actually much, more, much deeper than that, and there are a lot more indeterminacies in the way that metrics are created. So take, for example, something, you know, a similar sort of definition issue. So just borrowing from the, from the last talk, urbanization. It should be pretty simple to count how many people in this world live in an urban area. I mean, think of what an urban area is. It's a fairly large population, fairly densely packed, lots of economic opportunities and so on, but large population, densely packed. Take a country like India. How urban is India? Officially speaking, it is 31% urban. Actually speaking, 
is probably more like 69% urban. As of 2001, something close to 70% of the population lived with urban-like population density, over 400 people per square kilometers. The figures are not available for 2011, but just that distinction, 69% live in conditions that we would probably think about as urban, that probably require an urban-like infrastructure response that probably have the same kind of social connections as we associate with urban, that's really different than the 31% that dominates both the politics of thinking of India as a rural country, as well as, as I'll explain, some, some of the fiscal transfers. So that's one of, there are, and there are lots of definitional issues, and it's something where you think, oh, this is what I think when I read the word, but if you look at the metadata, and I grew up and did a lot of this uh, economics before everything was digitized. So I actually did read a lot of metadata, and it's a little bit, it was a little bit like a Michael Pollan kind of revelation when you read everything that goes into a metric. You don't necessarily want to, but you should. So that's the definitional issue. But within the definitional issue, so take GDP. Don't quibble with the definition. It's, you know, GDP is what it is. Within that, you have these sensitivities to technical details. So, Nigeria, last year, overnight, went from an economy of about, I think, about 40 trillion naira to 82 trillion naira, basically overnight. How did that happen? Massive growth, did anything change? No, they, recal they recalculated GDP by changing the base year from 1990 to 2010. What changing the base year does in the formula is it essentially shows the size of different sectors of economic activity, and in the calculation, it rebalances activity across the, the areas in which people are producing goods and services. So a lot obviously happened between 1990 and 2010. In 2010, you had the film industry, you had the rise of mobile phones, you had the rise of mobile phone-enabled services, etc. But the economy did not just magically double. That was a technical adjustment. It should have happened more often. And granted, uh, the, the sort of the, the user guide to GDP does say that you're supposed to update your base year at least every five years. Not many countries, or uh, many countries where you'd be most interested in the growth rates do not do that often. So that's another thing. Then, if that weren't enough, then you get into concepts that are deeply important where everybody has an idea of what they're about, but are really hard to define and pin down. So poverty. There's an elaborate economic philosophy of poverty. So things like, is it relative? So you have the, the Sen version. Is it a poverty of capabilities? Is it caloric intake? If it's caloric intake, how does that map to modern versions of malnutrition? So it's really something that's, that's hard to pin down. So what do you do about that? Because we want to know poverty rates. We want to compare them across countries. We want to deal with this. So going back to India examples, I live in India, so I know these. Bihar. Bihar, how poor is Bihar? A state of about 90, 90 billion people, one of the poorest in India. So the Tendulkar Committee estimates say that it's 33% of the people live below the poverty line. The Rangarajan Committee, I'm mentioning these names for a reason, says that 43%, so 33 to 43%. That's a, that's a pretty sizable chunk of 90 million people. Both of these are committees that were within two or three years of each other, appointed by the relevant authority, the Planning Commission, headed by eminent economists, using academically defensible methods, in view of the same set of household sampling data that were available to both. Same process. So this indeterminacy still comes out when you apply the same process to choosing the metric. And it's a perfectly good process. There's nothing wrong with that. Last example, or last sort of category of major indeterminacy comes when we're trying, and this is particularly important for sustainability, when we're trying to think about phenomena that are complex and dynamic, where we need to have some sense of progress, some sense of change. So if you think about the impact of emissions on warming, you have lots of choices to make. You can think about over what time frame. You can think about over what region. Some of it, it doesn't matter as much because the gases are globally mixed. Sometimes it matters very much. So for some of the aerosols, it matters a lot which region you pick. These things are questions that have to be resolved, and they are resolved. The scientific literature is full of different metrics for characterizing. And some of these are not known. Some of the, uh, some of the, some of the knowledge is still evolving. But the point is that there are lots of metrics to choose from that have particular use cases and particular responses engaging our social response to that. And so metrics are not the problem. There's a lot of effort to come up with new metrics, and I think that's great, but metrics 
they're indeterminate, we need to live with it. It's one of these things where I think as reasonable decision makers, as members of corporate society, probably go after the best way to measure what you need to measure when it really matters. And I think if you don't read the labels on, what you, on the definition of exactly what you're getting, then that's just laziness. That's like eating processed food and not paying attention to whether there's so much corn in it, going back to the, the, the pollen analogy. The bigger problem here is that when you couple this indeterminacy in metrics, this fact that metrics are essentially a choice about a standard, with what we do with them in governance and the way that we, what we do in the name of good governance, which is essentially to say that good governance should be unbiased, it should be impersonal, it should award rights to all who are eligible, it should be transparent and explicable in concrete terms. These are all virtues, and I'm not saying they're not virtues, but what I'm saying is when you take the metrics and you take the way things are measured, and you plug them into these governance virtues, and often they're plugged in, not at the kind of thing we think of as politics, the kinds of debates that happen in Parliament or Congress, where you have a bunch of different facts measured in different ways, defended in different ways, presented to human beings who somehow collectively, through a decision rule, make a decision. But when you take these metrics and you plug them into the, the plumbing of good governance, the things that don't, you don't see very often, then you essentially have something arbitrary attached to something rigid. Doesn't sound like a very good idea. But just some examples of this, why these metrics matter, and this is why I'm, I'm actually not so bothered about the GDP controversy, because it's hard to think, I mean, there aren't very many things that are really explicitly like indexed in a, in a you know, what, uh, what Cyril calls an institutional fact uh, with deontic powers, the fact that demands a socially conventional response to it. We don't vote in response to where the GDP is, we vote in response to whether we personally or our neighbors or the people we see feel like things are getting economically better or worse. And so the GDP doesn't bother me as much as, as where these metrics attach to the plumbing, where they attach to formula-based transfers. Formula-based transfers in federalism are a very good thing. They reduce or arbitrary bias about investing too much in one region, favoring a political protege in another region. And they're simple. You measure something, the level of education. You allocate a certain amount of resources based to shore up the education system. You can do it in a performance-based way, but it combines a metric with a financial reward. So with Bihar, for example, when you go back to why that 33 versus 43 really matters, why that's a highly political number, is because the transfers from the Finance Commission and the Planning Commission have poverty and the, the poverty rate as a, significant as a significant variable in the calculation of transfers from center to state. So that's, form and formula-based transfers are not unique to India, it's a fairly common technique. The second is when you get into identification of eligibility categories. So eligibility for benefits, that's where whether you're above or below the poverty line, whether or not your GDP, this is actually one place where GDP matters. So Ghana had a, a revaluation, a similar re, um, rebalancing of its base year, and all of a sudden went from a low-income country to a middle-income country, therefore affecting its, its uh, eligibility for IDA, which is a, the most highly concessional form of development finance. But in other cases, these, these eligibility criteria Things like urban versus rural. So 33% of the funding that goes from central governments to local governments is contingent on whether a settlement is defined as urban or rural. Mostly it goes to rural, so there's not a big clamor to switch this over. But these beneficiary criteria that in the abstract, in the name of good governance, in the name of objectivity, look good, when you couple that with the fact that met the metric is usually a choice among several competing alternatives, then you run into an issue. And once these, once these metrics start to have financial conditions or financial rewards attached to them, then the interest groups grow, commitment, and in the name of commitment, things remain fixed. So sometimes they're updated, I'm not saying it's not, but the tendency is to keep things as they are. You have the same issue with market-based mechanisms. Another one of these things that's on the forefront of good governance, also perfectly reasonable in its own right. You define a goal, you say those who can reach that goal, those who can innovate to do it more cheaply, those who can reach that goal at less cost, they'll do it first. Overall, there's a low, overall, you have a lower social cost 
of achieving of this goal. Perfectly fine. But what's the yardstick? That yardstick is a metric, that yardstick is a choice. And you need to be very, very careful about the choice in a way that historical example has shown that we are not always careful. So you get into these issues of the plumbing meets something that's fair, the plumbing that tends to not, you know, this is really the, the groups that are most interested in the outcome, the groups that are being measured tend to be most interested in this. And it really, it's not good stuff for tweeting, it's not good stuff for the headlines, but it matters and it becomes fixed. You match that to metrics, which are essentially a choice, often made in perfectly reasonable ways. And the combination of these two things introduces rigidities that, if we think about the larger social superstructures, can lead us in the wrong direction and can lead us unconsciously, almost mechanically, in the wrong direction. So what do we do? Do we just invent more metrics? Do we switch our notions of good governance? I argue that we actually need to think about both, and we need to think about the competition. So one of the really nice things is that there's more, techno there, there's more technological scope for competition in metrics. People leave more digital traces. It's easier to aggregate them. It's easier and cheaper to survey. Sensor costs are going down. It's easier to come up with your own credible version of reality argue for its credibility and show an alternate picture of what the problem, the dots that need to be connected, the problem we need to act on. As philanthropists, as people who are interested in producing for the public good, this is a good cause to support. This is something that the production of new metrics is often produced by those who are most interested in how they look. But as a matter of contribution to the public, I wish academics did more of this. I wish philanthropists did more of this. This is an important intervention in the structure of how we as a species manage to solve problems. The second piece is in thinking about how we can make our institutions a little more metric proof. So it's one thing for me to say, you know, tweet this talk or listen to these examples. It's another thing to think, how can we build in checkpoints to review the metrics? Just like we have zero-based budgeting, why not have periodic reviews when we update our metrics? This already happens to some extent. So the social cost of carbon in the US is updated in, in the basis of the latest science. Um, this happens in the nonprofit realm. It needs to happen more often. The other is decentralization. If you have decentralized decision making and you have more variety, more diversity of metrics choices because you have more people who are in control of particular contextual decisions, then you have effectively the same thing you run less of a risk of making one big mistake that channels a lot of resources in one direction. And the last is to really think about why we value the impersonality and why we value the, un the absence of human discretion in governance. And I think that also that comes back to some of the questions that were brought up earlier, is this notion that humans are meant to be contained. Humans are self-serving and the institutions need to contain them. And I think if you look around, if you look around at people who are procuring pumps for a water distribution network, the people who are running cities, the people who are actually in the bureaucracies, they're people. They know once in a while you might get, once in a while there will be corruption, once in a while there will be discretion. But often, you'll have people rising to the occasion, surveying everything they can possibly find, and making the right decision. And to the extent that we can open up more spaces of discretion as the definition of good governance, which is a bit of a reversal, I think that would make for a much more human and much more nuanced way of connecting the dots. Thank you. <laughs>